I don't have a personal encounter per se, but I believe this story should be told nonetheless. And I'm curious if anybody else out there has had a similar experience or has seen anything in the wild that they can't explain. My tale starts at a history museum in the Western United States. I used to work there for quite a while. I don't want to say the name of the museum, but I will say that we were near the Rocky Mountains. My personal area of study was prehistoric. I quite liked the challenge of trying to piece things together from a time before written records. You have to be both a scientist and a historian to get things right. And even then, some things still remain a mystery despite your best efforts. After spending eight years on my education, I taught for several years and I did many field studies. I didn't expect I would end up working at a museum, but I can't complain too much. We had quite an extensive collection of artifacts from various ages of prehistory. I loved cataloging items in the archives as well as answering questions from curious minds. All types of people would come to the museum, but I admit that I was quite surprised to see two local park rangers in their uniforms waiting for me at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. They wanted to know my thoughts on a couple of ancient tools. That's not typically abnormal. Sometimes people will find artifacts and bring them in. The rangers had brought me two fluted spear points and a scrapper. I remember them well. They were made in the Clovis style. The rangers didn't want to tell me at first where they were found, but I started to put the pieces together, and eventually they told me the story. And it was quite a story at that. There had been a few sightings of wild men in remote locations around the mountains both in the United States and in Canada. I'm not talking about national parks or heavily populated hiking trails, but instead backpackers who head way off marked trails. People exploring deep into the wilderness, often in near untouched areas. The rangers that patrolled this particular area had received a report from two hikers who claimed to have seen a wild looking man in the backcountry with no gear. The area was surrounded by miles of wilderness with no access roads nearby. The hikers recorded the GPS coordinates of where they saw the man and reported it to the ranger station. The rangers investigated this particular incident, and after a long search, they found a cave with a primitively built structure around the outside. Something similar to a hut or a lean-to with a woven roof is the way they described it. They said they found these tools in the cave along with several others and there were signs of recent human activity. I had to check my calendar to see if this was an April Fool's joke. It would have been a great one, but the rangers were dead serious. The tools they had presented me were near identical recreations of the Clovis style of tools found in America around 13,000 years ago. I still didn't quite believe them though. I'm quite skeptical of an unknown population's ability to remain hidden in the wilderness for so many years without any contact with the modern world. Why haven't we had more sightings of these wild people? And if they're out there, what exactly are they? The tools certainly looked Clovis, but the Clovis people disappeared around 9,000 years ago. The rangers both theorized that they could be responsible for the Sasquatch sightings that seemed to be prevalent throughout the continent. I think there's more to it than that, but I don't have any plausible theories myself. I asked the rangers to bring me to the site, but they refused. Imagine what we could learn from these people if they actually do exist out there. There are so many things that we don't know about their culture. We could learn what language they spoke. I can't really explain what an incredible find this would be for us historians. If the story's true, these people sound like they're living just like they were roughly 13,000 years ago, when they were hunting mammoths and mastodons across the plains. I imagine they must still be hunting big game with those fluted spear points. I do understand the rangers' reservations, though. If such a thing got out, I don't imagine it would go well for the wild people. They likely have no immunity to our diseases, and I don't suppose they would welcome us with open arms should we try to find them but I can't tell you how badly I wanted to see that sight. I would have done anything. Both of the rangers said the sightings were in extremely remote areas, so remote that it was surprising to even find hikers there, and they hope to leave whatever or whoever is living out there alone for the time being. Their curiosity got the best of them, so they found me. I was the verification they needed. 
This experience happened to me about 15 years ago now, and I still think about it quite often. I found myself taking long hiking trips in remote locations across the continent, but I haven't yet had a sighting of my own. If they are indeed out there, and this wasn't an elaborate prank, they're keeping themselves very well hidden. They're doing it very well. I wish I had been closer to everything that happened. I wish I knew more. If I had been closer, though, I might not have the privilege of sharing this story. They might have realized that I was there, and I saw it happen. They might not have even let me quit my job and stay alive. Up until a year ago, I worked for a very prominent corporation. My role was a small one, just delivering orders in a timely two-day fashion. I covered the northern half of a sprawling American city. I can't give out too many details, I'm sorry. Proper nouns are how people get caught. Most of my deliveries went out to businesses. Very rarely did I travel into the suburbs to make residential drops. My days were fairly routine. I arrived at the distribution center at 4 a.m., loaded my blue van, and headed into the city. Deliveries took all day to complete, and every day was basically the same. And then, one day, my routine changed, and that was the moment I knew that something was wrong. After loading my truck, I was stopped by one of my supervisors. He handed me an additional box, and he asked if I would take it around with me. There was no label, no address describing where the box was going to or coming from. It wasn't paid for by any type of postage or stamp. It was an unremarkable box, half the size of a basketball. The cardboard packaging was colored black, and I had never seen a box quite like it. When I asked where the package was going, my supervisor just waved me off. They assured me that it wasn't a delivery. I simply needed to carry the box with me along my route. They promised that other drivers had done so in the past. It was simply my turn, they explained. They said the box hadn't seen the northern half of the city just yet. Now the way they described that was concerning. The way they said the box hadn't seen the city. I figured they had just misspoken, but I never clarified, thinking it was just a simple mistake. In my mind, they were testing some new GPS product that would likely be installed in our vehicles in the future and they were keeping it in the box to keep anybody from tampering with it. The bonus they told me about, if I completed this trip without damage to the package, was more than enough to seal the deal for me. So I drove around with my little black box. I kept it with me on the passenger seat. I wanted to have my eyes on it, obviously. When I stopped for lunch, I started to doubt my GPS theory, though, because after spending time with it, I could tell that the package was humming. As I was sitting there in my seat, working my way through a slice of pizza, I kept glancing over at the box, and I almost jumped out of the van when it vibrated. I nearly dropped my slice, and for a few seconds I was convinced that I had been tricked into smuggling a bomb on board my van. When it didn't explode, I figured I was overreacting because it stopped humming once I finished my meal. In my mind, I joked with myself that the box was just hungry envious of my lunch break. Either that or else it was impatient and wanted to get back on the road. For some reason, that idea stuck with me. Was this package keeping its own schedule? I then returned back to the distribution facility at the end of the day, and a different supervisor retrieved the box from my vehicle. They thanked me for a job well done and carried the package out of sight. As I handed it to them, I asked what it was. I even pitched my GPS theory. The question earned me a glare and a long period of silence. I quickly apologized and left for the day. That reaction now had me determined, though. I was now wanting to find out what was inside that box. I spoke to the other drivers, and I learned pretty quickly which of them had already given the box a tour of their delivery route. So that narrowed down who would be escorting the package next. I kept my eye on those drivers who would be next. I then watched as one of them received the box and drove it around without incident. The next driver, however, was not so lucky. I arrived at the facility early that afternoon. 
I had rushed through my deliveries and skipped lunch so that I could arrive before this next driver. I wanted to see him hand off the box. Instead, when he pulled in, I watched as he jumped out of his driver's seat, screaming. I kept my distance. I ducked into my own van and I hunched down a bit behind the windshield. I wanted to watch as best as I could, but I did not want to get caught. I watched as the frantic driver was tackled by security. I didn't even know we had security that could deal with that kind of thing. They pinned him to the ground and bound his hands. And might I say that they looked very professional while doing it. That driver was then carried away, hogtied. I guess they even knocked him unconscious somehow. And then next I watched as my supervisors rushed into his truck and brought out the box. I could see from my seat that the black cardboard had been torn open. They were all obviously scared. They were all on their cell phones and moving so hurriedly that I wasn't surprised when two of them collided. This caused the box to fall, and I could see something tumble out. It was shaped like a small pyramid. Most of it was silver, the color of steel, and the way the light hit it, I'm confident that it was metal. But what I could not understand were the veins. These thin green streaks ran across the surface of this pyramid thing. It looked like a leaf or thinly stretched skin. The streaks were pulsating too, throbbing. Watching it made my head ache. Whatever it was was scooped back into its box and the team of supervisors all scurried off to their offices. Someone was going to be upset with them, I could tell. But I could also tell that the pyramid thing was not ours. It didn't look like any piece of technology that I had ever seen, and plenty had passed through my hands. When the other driver, the one who broke the box, didn't come back to work, I knew something was very wrong. I knew my company was hiding something. I instantly decided to quit, and I let things get quiet. But your channel, Lilith, has given me a unique opportunity I've taken all the measures I need to stay safe. And I think that you and your followers deserve to know about this. You can spread the word and you can warn others without endangering me. I think the big corporations out there are working for somebody else. Maybe the government, maybe something even bigger. I think that they're driving around and scanning our cities. I think they're preparing for something and I don't know what it is. I just know that if I stay silent, none of us will be ready for it. I am well aware that I'm going to sound like an absolute lunatic here, but I swear to you that this is a true story and I wouldn't be telling it if it wasn't. I've never told a lie in my life. I physically can't do it. Five years ago, when I first got out of the army and moved to Kentucky, I decided to get a dog. I had long loved chows, so at the time I figured there was no better opportunity than to get one. It's hard to find a good chow breeder, but I managed to find one all the way up in South Dakota. She was a gorgeous red chow that I named Foxy. I got a good deal on her from the breeder because she had been saved back for breeding stock, but as it turned out, she was infertile, so she was already a year and a half by the time I brought her back to Kentucky to live with me. This dog was not used to the Kentucky woods. She had lived her life on the flatlands of the prairie, so every time we'd go for a walk in the wooded trails, she was eager to take off ahead of me and search the area. Then, every night, when we would get home, I would spend about an hour in the yard with her, picking the burrs and the twigs out of her thick fur before we got into the house. But on this particular day, we had been at the trails maybe an hour before the sky took on this weird dark gray coloring, and I started noticing flashes of light behind the clouds. It looked strange, like an unusual storm was rolling in, but in a really unusual way. So I called Foxy, and we headed back to my truck and headed home. Oddly though, just a quarter of a mile down the road, the sky was clear. I thought about heading back, thinking the storm was passing over quickly, but Foxy was already in the car and I didn't want to confuse her by heading back again, so we just went home. I grabbed a box of grooming tools and sat out on the porch to clean her up, and that's when I noticed that the sky overhead was now looking very much the same way it had when we were at the trail. Still, 
I thought it was just a strange storm brewing, and I called Foxy over in the hopes that we would get her cleaned up and in the house before the rain started pouring down. Now, chows are naturally nervous dogs, by the way, so at first it didn't really stand out to me that she seemed anxious about the change of the weather. But she kept looking at the sky and taking in the distant flashing behind the clouds, and every now and then she'd let out this deep, low growl. I tried to reassure her, told her it's okay, but she didn't seem to believe me. All at once, though, I got scared too. I watched as something dark came down, lowering itself through the clouds. It never quite came out from fully behind them, but eventually it was close enough to the bottom of the clouds that I could see the shape of it hovering, just above the mist. It was large and round, and the flashing lights were attached to its ends. Foxy pulled away from me, and she ran to the edge of the yard, where she was now directly below this thing. And then she started barking up at the sky, and she was obviously protecting me, trying to chase it off. As she stood there barking, a large flash of light came out from under the object, and a beam came through the cloud, zeroing in on her. She was right in the middle of it, barking away, and the beam seemed to be almost magnetized. There was enough static within the beam that her fluffy coat was raised, sticking out in every direction. And then there was this strobe light, dark light, dark light, flashing so quickly I had to squint my eyes to protect myself. It lasted only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the skies were clear blue and sunny. There wasn't a cloud anywhere, and Foxy was gone. I ran over to my neighbor's house and knocked on the door for help. I just needed somebody else to be helping me deal with this. I also asked them if they had seen what I had seen, but they just shook their head no. My neighbor said she'd been home all day, but hadn't heard or seen a thing, and that she was just now in the kitchen cooking. And that's when I realized that she was making supper, and I looked down at my watch. Four hours had passed. I don't know how I lost that much time. The strobing only went on for less than a minute, it felt like and Foxy and I were just getting ready to head in for lunch when this all started. Had I really sat on the porch all that time, staring off at nothing? I had no idea how to deal with what I was experiencing, and so I headed back home, hoping to find Foxy back there. Luckily, she was standing on the porch at the front door when I got there, but she had this strange look in her eyes, and she was just standing, still, like a statue. But even stranger yet was the fact that her fur was still standing on end like it was when I had last seen her. Standing, sticking out in all directions. To be honest, it was the better part of a week before she returned to normal. I don't have any good answers for what I experienced that day. I can only hope that whatever it was stays far away from us and that we never ever have to experience it again. So... I'm currently sitting in a hotel two cities away from my house. Honestly, I am terrified and I don't know if I'll ever even be able to return there. It's an older house that was built back in 1953 or so, but it's just beautiful, so maybe I will go back. I just don't know right now. I've lived there for two and a half years. I can say I've noticed some small things that should have been warnings. Obviously, I didn't care then. I do now, though. It's all starting to make a lot of sense. I've had times where I put my coffee down on my desk, and then when I go to take a sip, somehow the cup is on the coffee table. I found drawers and cabinets open, even though I obsessively close them when I'm done. I've heard squeaks, creaks, and bangs, but I always just figured it was the wind or maybe even the house itself since it's so old. Sometimes there was a slight knocking coming from the attic, but again I just thought it was the wind or something. More recently, there have been cold spots, like really cold spots. I made a mental note to have an AC guy come out and take a look. One of my friends stayed the night about a month ago, and they said that it felt like someone was watching them. They also swore that someone was sitting on the bed while they slept. I have cameras in my house, but not in any of the three guest rooms or the bathrooms. Anyway, this past Thursday, I came home from work at about 7.30. I brought home sushi and dumplings for dinner, and I turned on my favorite internet radio rock station and I was sitting down to eat when the air got extremely cold. It was freezing, like so cold that my glass of water frosted over. 
All of a sudden, my music stopped playing. I spun around to see if somebody had walked in and messed with my Bluetooth, but no one was there. Just me, alone in the dining room. And then about 30 seconds later, my music blasted back on, way louder than it had been. I jumped about 10 feet in the air, it felt like, and I told myself that it had to just be the Wi-Fi connection, that it was unstable for a moment and then turned back. And then all of my food was on the other side of the table, exactly in the same positioning as I had left it. Well, mostly, I guess. I'm embarrassed to tell you this because any normal person would have left pronto. Everything was as I left it, but it was on the opposite side of the table. I guess I told myself I had just misremembered where I'd put everything. I don't know. I sat down to finally eat my food, thinking that maybe I was just overly hungry and not paying attention to what I was doing. But as soon as my butt hit the chair, I heard three extremely loud knocks from upstairs, just above the dining room. I ran up the stairs with my chopsticks still in my hand. I stopped at the top landing. Standing in the doorway of the guest bedroom was a man. He was almost see-through. He had this evil smile on his face, and his lips were thin and colorless, and his eyes were colorless as well. He looked sick. He was bone skinny, and he was wearing dark overalls with no shoes. I was terrified. I've never been terrified before. I wanted to run, but I just couldn't. I couldn't even speak. I don't know how long we were standing there staring at each other. It seemed like forever. My heart was thumping in my ears, and I was freezing. The air around me was so cold I could see my breath. He moved his hand so fast, if I could have moved, I would have jumped clear out of my skin. His skinny long finger was pointing up to the attic hatch. I felt like I wanted to move, I wanted to open the attic for him, but I just couldn't. I didn't even see him move, but now he was standing only a foot away from me, and I heard three loud knocks again, but I couldn't tell where they were coming from. Somehow I gained the use of my legs then, and I bolted. I don't think I've ever run so fast, not ever. I grabbed my keys and my cell phone and got out of there. I don't know what happened. What is in my house? Is there something in my attic? Who was that man? I have no idea. I'm still reeling, and I haven't left my hotel other than to buy some clothes because I literally left my house with nothing except a set of chopsticks in my hand. I've been researching and trying to find help, but so far, nothing. My friends all think I've completely lost it. I even sent my camera footage to a few of them and they just say it's a glitch. You can see me standing there frozen and then the video is just static for 4 minutes and 27 seconds. I checked my two other cameras footage and neither of them captured anything from the time I tried to sit down to eat the first time until I ran in to get my keys and my phone. It's just 9 minutes of static. I'm just really confused and terrified. I didn't even really want to reach out, but I felt so alone in this. Maybe knowing that someone has heard my story and has also been through something like this will help me. I know I have to figure it out. I only have four more days of leave time from my job left. So all of this happened on a fishing trip I took to Canada with my dad. We've been doing this trip for years, basically since I was in elementary school. It's one of the things I've looked forward to most each year. I really don't know if anyone has ever had an experience quite like this. I tried to search around on the internet, but there really wasn't much out there. If you've ever seen something like this, I'd like to hear about it. And that's why I'm putting the story out there like this, because I want to know if anybody else has ever seen the same thing. For years and years, we always went to the same lake system in rural Quebec. This past year, we had to go to a different lake because the cabin we've always used got booked up too fast. Everyone is obsessed with outdoor vacations since COVID, so that makes it really hard to get reservations. So we found a different cabin to rent in the same general region, and it was definitely more remote than our usual cabin. At the old place we could just drive up and park, it was kind of in a cluster of cabins and not super far from a small town. But at this new place, we actually had to park the car and boat out to the cabin. It was on the far side of the lake and much more remote. Now this lake was definitely shallower than the one we were used to. Lots of lakes are surrounded by a little marshland, but this lake had tons of it. And it wasn't very forested, just marshland as far as you could see. Also, it stank. 
Both my dad and I agreed that we wished we had researched the lake a little more, but it had been a last-minute booking. Some locals told us it was good fishing still, so we hoped that that would be the case. We loaded our stuff into the fishing boat and motored across the lake to our little cabin. When we unloaded our stuff out of the boat, I noticed some really weird depressions in the mud. They were really big and really wide, and they also appeared to have three very distinct branches on the imprint, almost like it was a massive footprint with splayed toes. I really didn't know what it was, so I didn't think much of it. We just kept unloading the boat, and I think we were destroying that mark in the mud with our footprints anyway. It was late already when we got into the cabin, so we didn't get to fish at all that first night. My dad and I grabbed a drink, sat on the porch, and looked out over the lake. It was nice. It was quiet. Normally lakes are loud with bugs and frogs and birds, but then I realized this one was strangely silent. I wouldn't say that it was eerily silent, but it was definitely strange. I remember one distinct sound in particular, this low, long, deep thumbing sound that was very consistent. And then it was a few days later that I actually saw it. We were renting the cabin for a week and our first few days of fishing were all right. I caught a handful, but my dad didn't really catch anything. The lake was definitely shallow and the fish didn't seem very big at all. One thing I did like about the lake was that it was relatively clear due in part to its shallowness. And that's why I was able to see the creature. It was midway through the week and we were over by the north shore of the lake. We hadn't finished here yet and my dad was hopeful that maybe he could finally reel something in. We were both unlucky all morning not catching a single fish. And I could see them down there, but nothing was biting. And then suddenly all the fish darted away, like they all swam as fast as possible as if they were being chased. I was leaning over the side of the boat trying to see if there were any left down there when it came up by our boat. It was the largest, most gruesome creature I have ever seen, and it looked absolutely disgusting and had this evil sense to it. It was the sort of thing I could imagine First Nations people creating stories about to warn their children. And it was probably 10 feet long and covered in massive, gross-looking warts. Its legs were probably one and a half times the length of its body, and it ended in webbed feet with huge, razor-sharp-looking talons at the end. The claws were probably as long as steak knives. Its head was the most disgusting and terrifying part. It had big yellow eyes, probably the size of soccer balls. Perched atop its eyeballs were these long, thin spines that looked like horns. This monster swam right below our boat, probably 20 feet down. I don't know if it was aware of us or not, but I did know that this was what the fish had been running away from. We watched as it swam away, and then we turned on our motor and went to a different part of the lake. I don't think I was afraid of it until later that night. At first, it just seemed like we had seen a really cool piece of wildlife, something to report to National Geographic. That night, though, both my dad and I, we saw it again, and it left us terrified. Once again, we were sitting on the porch enjoying a drink, and as the sun set, that long, low thrumming began again, the same thrumming that we'd heard the night before, and it seemed to be getting louder and louder, and my dad and I were trying to see where it was coming from, out from across the lake. And as we strained our eyes to see in the darkness, something happened that shocked and terrified us both. Probably a hundred yards out in the middle of the lake were those big yellow eyes. And they were staring straight at us. And that thrumming got louder. It knew we were here. It was watching us. That absolutely freaked us out and we both went inside and locked the door. We left the next day and I don't think we will be going back to that particular lake ever again. I don't know if what I saw was just some freak of nature that had been alive for too long, or if it was some sort of ancient spirit. Either way, it still gives me the heebie-jeebies. I've lived in New Mexico my whole life. We see strange things on a daily basis. It isn't unusual for us, I guess. If you're a New Mexico native, you grow up hearing all sorts of bizarre stories. But these stories are real to those of us who have experienced them. They aren't stories that have been made up. And on top of that, New Mexico has a lot of underlying superstition. It's as if the place was made of it. If you talk to any of the Apaches or Navajo, or just anyone who has had a long family tie to the state, they will all tell you a similar story. You can ask them about the lights in the sky, 
and they will all usually just nod their heads. They've known about the lights. They've seen the lights. And they've all just accepted them as part of the world. I guess I'm more of a skeptic. Yes, I know of a lot of unusual happenings, but I'm also a firm believer in science and facts. So when I moved into the house across from a New Mexico Air Force base, I guess I didn't realize the activity that I'd be exposing myself and my children to. We'd lived in my home for a few years before anything really started to happen. Of course, we'd see different aircrafts leave at night, but usually only during the night. But one night late at night, sometime in June, we started hearing unusual noises coming from the base. They were loud, so loud. They woke up the whole household. Really, they reminded me of a type of doomsday siren you would hear in a movie. At first, I was scared because I wasn't sure if it was some type of siren to get us to evacuate. But when I noticed all of my surrounding neighbors were out on their porches pointing toward the sky, I realized it was something more bizarre. In the sky were these strange orbs. They didn't move like a plane or a helicopter. They actually seemed to weave and dance with each other. It was weird. But soon the orbs vanished, lasted maybe two minutes, and the noise stopped too. I see all my neighbors going inside and none of them are really talking to each other. And I didn't know any of them well enough to start a conversation about what had happened. So we went inside too. The next morning I had a terrible painful headache, so did the rest of my family. I called into work because I couldn't even function. The lights hurt my eyes and so did sounds, like a migraine. A few weeks passed and then we heard the noise again, but this time it sounded like a low hum. I peeked out the window and the neighbors were all inside it seemed. So I looked up at the sky and I could see those orbs again, but they seemed further away. That next morning, I had another headache, and it was painful, but not nearly as bad as the time prior. Weeks would pass in between the events, but we all started to get used to it. Even headaches became a normal part of our lives. I know, it was strange. But just as we started to get used to these things, we started to experience other stuff. One night, we heard this noise, and one of my kids came into my room complaining about this weird tapping noise coming from the backyard. I told them that I would check if they promised that they'd go to sleep right after. They agreed. So I went to the back door and I opened it. I looked around the porch, but I didn't see anything unusual. So I went back inside and instructed them to go back to sleep. The next day, again, I wasn't feeling well. Yes, I had a headache, but I also was just very fatigued and weak. I thought I might be getting a cold, so I stayed home from work. I was going around the house picking things up. My kids had left a bunch of toys in our living room, so I went into their room to put it all away. Obviously, the room wasn't in any better condition, so I started grabbing dirty socks and clothes from the floor, and I opened their curtains to let the light in. But as soon as I pulled the curtains open, I noticed that there was the shape of a hand on their window. We do get a lot of sandstorms, so the handprint looked like it was left on the outside of the window but the window was almost completely absent of dirt, almost as if the hand had wiped it away. To be sure, I wiped the glass with my finger. Handprint was definitely on the outside. But the thing that really bothered me about the handprint was that the palm was very tiny, but the fingers were long and thin. I thought maybe my kids had been in the backyard and wanted to scare me by creating the strange handprint. So I guess I didn't let it bother me too much. But I went ahead and I looked outside once again. I walked over to their window, and I could see the handprint from outside now. And underneath the handprint, I saw more handprints all along the windowsill. And below that, I saw what looked like two feet imprinted in the dirt. It was clear that somebody had been standing at the window, but the feet were small, like the size of my kids. However, the shape did not appear to be normal. I'll be honest, the dirt seemed to have been disturbed. The footprints weren't very clear, but they looked more like handprints than footprints. The sole seemed longer than the palm, but the toes were long, just like the handprint on the window. Who knows? Maybe they were just more handprints in the dirt. But again, the placement of everything seemed a bit too elaborate for my kids, and that's when I started to feel a little uncomfortable. 
Seeing the bizarre traces of someone or something outside my kid's room did not make me feel very good about the stories I had heard growing up, even if I was a skeptic. Anyway, we still experience strange things to this day. Even the strange handprints left after nights of odd activities at the Air Force Base. So who knows what's going on? I can only hope for the best. This encounter takes place in Trigo County, Kansas, in the summer of 1999. I'm submitting my encounter to you, Lilith, because I think it could help others who might be going through something similar. I was really struggling before I came across your channel, and your videos have honestly been a lifesaver. I'm going to leave my name out of this, but here's my story. I was born and raised in a small town near Trigo County, Kansas, with a population of just a few thousand people. I grew up on a farm experiencing all the ups and downs that come with country living, but I loved it. I still do. We're a family of six, and I'm the oldest daughter with three younger brothers. My family all loved the smell of dirt in the air, and I loved spending long hours outside playing with my brothers. We would chase each other around the fields or play games of tag in the barn. I went to school right here in Trigo County, and then I went off to college. I was the first in my family to do so, but I was headstrong, and I wanted to learn about marketing and other ways that I wanted to try to help the farm. I always knew that I wanted to come back, though, and so after graduating, I moved back to the farm and lived there helping my mom and dad, while also working down the road at Shiloh Vineyard and Winery. So anyway, back during the summer that this happened, in 1999, one of my favorite ways to spend my weekends was at Cedar Bluff State Park. It's just a short drive from the farm, only about 20 minutes, and it's the perfect place to get away from it all. So I went hiking at Cedar Bluff State Park where I knew I could clear my head. It's quiet and peaceful, and it's a great escape from the hustle and bustle. So I was hiking along my favorite trail when I saw something moving in the bushes up ahead. It caught my eye because it wasn't the normal kind of movement that I'm used to seeing while hiking. At first I thought it might be a deer, but then I realized that it was too big to be a deer. The bushes were moving in a way that I knew the thing had to be huge. I started thinking and trying to figure out what it could be, but no good answers came to mind. So I slowly approached the bushes as they moved back and forth. And when I got close, that's when everything went quiet. I couldn't hear the birds anymore, and the only sound was the sound of my heart beating in my ears. I slowly parted the bushes, and that's when I saw it, and everything clicked into slow motion. The thing's fur was matted and black, and it was staring at me with these cold, dead eyes. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I was paralyzed by fear looking into the blackness of this creature. The creature slowly started to step towards me and I could feel the fear coursing through my veins. I honestly felt that this could be it. The day I was going to die. I watched as the thing approached, and it was so tall I couldn't even see its head as the sun threw its body into silhouette. I knew it was staring down at me, though, and I felt small and weak and insignificant in comparison. I didn't know what it was. I could only make out the outline, but it definitely wasn't anything I had ever seen before. If I had been able to think at the time, I would have felt like I was in a horror movie. You know, the poor girl that gets attacked by a creature on a deserted trail. One thing I can say, though, is that the creature had wolf or dog-like characteristics. With a long snout and sharp teeth, it seemed to be studying me, as if it was trying to figure out what I was while it loomed over me. I didn't know what to make of it, but I was definitely scared. I can also say that I remember its smell. It smelled strange, like something I had never smelled before, but familiar at the same time. It was musty and earthy, but not in a pleasant way, and it made my skin crawl. I can't say for sure how long we were in that position, with me huddled to the ground and this beast looming over me, when suddenly I heard the sound of branches snapping, about 20 to 30 feet away. I'm sure the creature must have heard the noise too because it turned its head and then it ran away into the woods, towards the noise. I was shaking 
and I could barely breathe. I'd never been so scared in my life as I watched it disappear into the trees, moving quickly as if it had been activated by hearing the noise that we both heard, moving quickly like in a hunting kind of a way. And even though I was scared, I also couldn't help but be curious about what this thing was, wondering what it was exactly. What was it doing in the woods? Why was it so curious about and interested in me? Well, you won't be surprised to hear that right then and there, I decided to leave and head home. I was so shaken up, but I managed to get myself out of the park and back to my car and back on the highway. I couldn't stop thinking about that creature, though, and I'm pretty sure it was following me as I left. Not in a way that it wanted me to see it, but in a way that it was curious, but didn't want to be seen. I say this because I feel like I caught a glimpse of movement in the woods along the exit as I left. It wasn't until I got home that everything seemed to come back to me, and I could finally take a breath. But for the rest of the day, and even weeks later, I felt like that creature had somehow changed me. Changed my perspective on life, and what's important. I've actually been back to the woods several times, but never alone. I always now take a friend or one of my brothers with me, and it's always in the daylight, never at dusk, never at dark. I'm hoping to catch a glimpse of that creature again, but to this day, I haven't seen it again. Maybe one day I will, but for now, I'm content with just knowing that it exists. I don't know why, but I like to think that it's still out there somewhere, living its life in the woods, undisturbed by humans. This encounter takes place on January 1st, 2001, in Washington County, Pennsylvania. One reason I'm submitting my encounter to this channel is because I believe that sharing my experience with this large, wolf-like creature will allow others to learn more about it and potentially help protect themselves from encountering similar creatures and maybe use that information for their own safety. My name is Doug, and I live outside of Washington, PA, which is a charming small town located in southwestern Pennsylvania, about 30 minutes' drive from Pittsburgh. It's surrounded by lush green forests and rolling hills. Basically, the county is full of farms and lots of untouched land. Because of this, the area offers residents and visitors the opportunity to experience nature at its finest. However, because of its idyllic setting, Washington, PA is also experiencing a lot of new home construction, and at the same time, a variety of mysterious creatures and other strange animal encounters have been reported. There have been whispers that the creatures are being forced from their homes by the new construction and that they're now seeking refuge in the surrounding forests and even coming into more populated areas. One creature seen in the area is described as a large, wolf-like animal. While little is known about this elusive creature, reports suggest that it possesses traits that are similar to both wolves and other large animals, such as bear and mountain lions. But some people also claim that it has human-like qualities and features, which is what I feel is the most disturbing part of its existence. I myself have had several encounters with what I believe to be a large wolf-like creature, something that can't be explained 100%, and it's these experiences that I'd like to share with you today. So I've lived my whole life near Washington, PA, and I've always been fascinated by stories of strange creatures and mysterious animal encounters that are said to take place in the area. In the beginning, I had never seen any of these creatures myself but I always kept an open mind, and I was eager to learn more about them. However, it was still a bit taboo to bring up the subject at all, let alone ask any old-timers in the area anything about it. Ultimately, it wasn't until I was an adult and had moved into my own home that I had my first encounter. That's when everything changed for me. I work as a writer and a researcher. I specialize in writing about weird and unexplained phenomena, which is how I first learned about this channel and why I'm so interested in the subject. So it was early morning on January 1st, 2001, when I first encountered these creatures. 
I had just gotten out of bed, and I had gotten up late after staying out longer than I had wanted at a New Year's Eve party. I was mad at myself for sleeping in, and I was finally getting ready for my day when I heard this loud noise coming from the outside, back in the yard. When I looked out the window, I was shocked to see a large, wolf-like creature standing there, smack dab in the middle of my backyard. The creature was confusing to look at. It didn't match anything my brain had ever seen before, but it looked a lot like the creature that I had heard stories about all my life. Things I had written about. Things I had read about. It was easily twice the size of a normal wolf, but at the same time, it did have these human-like features, such as its eyes and feet. And the most disturbing part of it was its mouth, though. It was filled with sharp teeth that looked like they could do serious damage. It was just standing there, staring back at me through the window. I didn't know how it knew I was there, and I couldn't figure out what to do about it being in my yard. So I just stood there and stared back at it. The truth is, I was sort of excited to see it. I mean, this was a culmination of all of my childhood fantasies and dreams about strange creatures. It was almost like a surreal moment for me. But after standing there for quite some time, the creature finally turned and ran off into the woods. Without a second thought, I grabbed my coat and my boots, and I rushed outside to try and follow it. But by the time I got there, it had disappeared into the trees. I stood in the same spot it had stood in, but was unable to see anything out of the ordinary right around the area. Not even any footprints. So I then decided to walk over to where it entered the woods. As I approached the edge of the woods, I was shocked at how easily I came up on it again. Now it was only 20 feet into the woods, but lying on the ground, not even looking back or paying any attention to me. I approached it slowly, trying to remain calm and not alarm it, but as I got closer, it jumped up and puffed out its chest, lifted its head and howled towards the sky. My instant thought was that it looked like it was trying to intimidate me, or maybe in a more sinister move, call out to others of its kind, like an alert. I decided to retaliate and I started making my own loud noises in an attempt to act like it did, but the creature just kept howling. I screamed too. I screamed back at it, but I was now getting scared and feeling like maybe I had gone too far. I even screamed and threatened to call the police but it didn't seem to phase the creature at all, obviously. I knew that what I was screaming was ridiculous, but those are the words that came out, for whatever reason. No one can know how they'll act in a situation that they've never been in before, especially one that just doesn't feel right. Finally, I decided that I had to get out of there. I started to inch backwards, hoping to work my way towards my house, and also hoping that the creature would just leave me alone. But as soon as I began to move, it let out a loud growl and then lunged at me. It was like I activated it by my movement. That's when I took a chance. I turned 180 degrees from the creature and ran for my life. I barely escaped the swing of its claws as I ran back towards the house. But the creature just kept coming. It chased after me, its claws just missing me as I ran for my life. I made it to my house and I slammed the back door shut behind me but the creature was right there too. It smashed into the door as I closed it, shattering the glass and sending splinters of wood flying through the air. But luckily, it didn't get through. The door stood steady and stayed in place. I was now in the kitchen and I swung around to grab a knife. But by the time I turned back around, thinking I would have to fight it if it continued through the door, the creature was gone. It was as if it had just vanished into thin air. It was no longer just outside the door, and no longer anywhere that I could see. Terrified and not knowing how to handle what just happened, I called the police and reported the encounter. Over the next few days, there was a massive search for the creature, but it was never found again. At least, that's what they said to me. We searched, but we didn't find anything. But I really wonder about that, because I did see the police looking around my backyard and whispering a lot to one another. But as soon as I came outside, they quickly got quiet and told me there was nothing to worry about. The next day, a crew of some sort showed up with cameras and what looked like detectors, 
but I have no idea who they were or what they were doing. In the end, for me, the creature will always remain just a bit of a mystery, a sign of something more that's out there in the world. It's as if I got a glimpse at what could be lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next chance to strike. And that reminder is enough to keep me on my toes for the rest of my life. As terrifying as it was, I'm actually grateful for having had that encounter because it validated a lot of my life's interests and ultimately my life's work. And for that, I am truly grateful. The last few days have been pure hell. Be careful while thrift shopping, and if you feel something off about the item you want to purchase, do not buy it. Trust your gut. I wish I had. I bought an antique vase from a thrift store a few towns over when my wife and I went on a small weekend trip. I had never been to that thrift store before. It was dark and cramped, but full of some neat stuff some of which included vintage clothing, various pieces of furniture, and the beautiful antique clay vase with native carvings of buffalo and birds that we bought. I set the vase on the center of my dining table when we got back, but when I stepped back to look at it, this weird sense of uneasiness came over me. I tried to put it past me and went to take my dog for a walk. I called her over to me, but I noticed the way she avoided the dining room table. She steered very hard clear of it, something she had never done before. I attached her leash onto her vest and, out of curiosity, pulled her towards the dining table. She locked her limbs and snarled, eyes fixated on the vase. I actually giggled. The weirdest things freaked that dog out. Then at one point during our walk, I heard humming from my left side, almost as if somebody had put their face right next to my ear. I whirled around, but nobody was there. It didn't sound like a mosquito, for example. The voice was melodic, like a human. When I got home, loud, fast footsteps came from behind me and through my front door. Then I listened as they traveled throughout the house like some invisible man was running around. I froze and listened while my dog barked her head off. There was nobody behind me, and I didn't see anything that could have caused that noise. I slowly shut the door behind me and tried to calm my dog. I was feeling pretty spooked too, honestly, so I phoned my wife to see when she would be coming home. While waiting for her, I hopped in the shower, closed my eyes, shampooed my hair, and hummed along to my music to try and calm myself. Then something about my music sounded weird, though. My heart dropped in my stomach when I realized that it wasn't my music that sounded weird but a second voice was humming another tune. And it was the same tune that I had briefly heard while walking the dog earlier. My eyes flew open and immediately I was met by another pair of eyes peeking at me from the front of my shower curtain. But then instantly they ducked away the moment I registered them. I screamed and my dog came rushing into the bathroom. I held on to her, shampoo still in my hair and dripping water everywhere. When my wife finally got home, I was a wreck. I had somehow managed to wash out the rest of the soap from my hair and put on clothes. And then I sat with my back against the living room wall and my dog by my side. I wouldn't even let her leave the room. I didn't want her away from me. Every so often I swore I heard that cursed humming sound. But I wouldn't have put it past myself for imagining it because I was so on edge. My wife tried to comfort me, but I could tell that she didn't really believe me. She convinced me to head to bed, and after experiencing all that adrenaline, I was pretty tired anyway. That night, I woke up coughing so hard that I was seeing spots. I coughed up and gasped for breath, gagging and almost throwing up. Finally, I coughed so hard, a wad of hair came up. My wife and I stared at it in my hand. It was long and silky and black and covered in saliva. Neither of us knew what to say. In the silence, I heard that damn humming again. There it is, I yelled, the humming. My wife's face turned pale, but at the same time, she mouthed the words, let's deal with this in the morning. I, on the other hand, was livid. What did she mean, the morning? We had to figure this out now. 
but something wasn't right about my wife's expression. It looked like she was trying to tell me something. She held out her arms for a hug, and hesitantly I leaned in. Silently, she breathed quietly in my ear. She's here, behind you. I froze. As my wife held me, I looked up and saw the terrible, horrible, sunken-in face peering at us from a vent behind me on the wall. I shut my eyes and buried them into my wife's chest. Something told me that if she saw us try to leave now, things would not end well. So that night I shut the dog in the room with us and wouldn't let her leave. We heard clanging and crashing downstairs all night long, but we knew nothing would come of going to check. The dark circles under my wife's eyes told me that she slept about the same as I did. We headed to the kitchen, in silence, not knowing what to expect, only to find the kitchen a complete mess. The cabinets were wide open and empty, with the contents shattered on the floor. It was a mess. All around us, there was the sound of a woman humming. Evil and otherworldly was how it sounded. I screamed, what the hell do you want from us? I grabbed the vase and threw it out the window. It flew right back and landed squarely on the table. I'd had enough. I'd watched enough horror movies to know that if we stayed here, it was not going to be good. I grabbed my keys, told my wife to get up, and I dropped my wife and dog at a friend's, and I'm now headed to the thrift shop I bought the vase from. I don't think this entity is going to give up, but the least I can do is to get it away from everybody I care about. I've seen the damage it can do. I'm one hour into a two-hour drive to that store, and I swear that every so often I keep seeing a pair of eyes staring back at me from my rearview mirror. Wish me luck. So there I was, doing the usual late-night stroll through the cemetery, just a short drive from my college. It's my favorite time of day to unwind. It's peaceful and quiet, and all you can hear is your own footsteps. There's lots of winding paths to walk along, too. The only thing that bothers me about this nightly walk is that nobody ever wants to do it with me. I'm sure the cemetery creeps them out, but I think it's beautiful and serene. Sometimes I just need alone time anyway, where the most exciting thing that could happen is seeing an owl or something. So that particular night, I was so lost in thought that it took me a second to realize that the rustling noise I was hearing wasn't just the wind in the trees. It sounded almost like an animal was very close. A big animal, like almost next to me. I turned around and saw nothing, so I kept going, but so did the noise. I turned back around again, trying to figure out what was going on, and this time I saw a dark figure looming about 25 or so feet away from me. Despite the darkness, I could see its eyes glimmering and staring back at me, and then the creature turned its head slightly. The eyes caught the moonlight, and I could see them glowing this reddish color. It was crazy. At the same time, it was hard to make out any other details in the dark, but I do think it had long, furry ears of some kind on top of its head, and long arms hanging down at its side all of which was so weird because it was standing there on its back legs, looking comfortable in that position. I screamed and I took off running towards my dorm, but soon looked back for any signs of the creature following me. I didn't see anything, and that's when it hit me. This is not normal. It wasn't something that exists in textbooks. It's a mutant of some sort. I tried to play it cool so I wouldn't freak out too much. But as soon as I was about to reach the exit, this thing emerged and within seconds was snarling and bared its teeth at me. It wasn't super tall, maybe a little taller than me. It sort of looked young too, but was very powerful looking. And the teeth looked sharp as hell. It was obvious that this thing was faster than me and that running would do me no good. But I had no choice. I didn't want to just stand there and wait to get attacked. So I kept running, and soon I could see the edge of campus ahead of me, which was at least more well-lit than the woods. And now that I was closer to home and nearer to buildings, I decided to scream. My hope was that my screaming would either alert somebody to what was going on, or maybe make the creature stop chasing me. I stopped, turned, and let out the loudest noise I could make, but the thing continued to run towards me. 
it was completely unfazed. But I had no choice but to continue making noise in hopes that somebody would hear. Or something would change. Change it did. Without warning or slowing down, the creature abruptly stopped and just turned around and started walking the other way. The way it was walking looked almost like a human walking, with its arms swinging side by side. Before I knew it, the police showed up and said that they had gotten a 911 call about screaming and a possible dog attack. I told them exactly what I experienced and I pointed out where I saw the creature. They politely looked around a bit, but who knows what they really thought. I mean, I'm sure they hear all kinds of crazy stories from drunk students and whatnot. And to add to me looking crazy to them, they found nothing. No tracks on the ground, no signs of it anywhere. Just nothing. And of course now I don't know either. Now that I'm home and safe, I'm doubting what happened too. Maybe I imagined the whole thing? But I don't think so. It's affected me too much to not have been real. Let's just say I've been back a few times, but now I only go before it's dark. And I've even been sure to wrangle a friend or two to accompany me each time. But so far, so good. I enjoy tuning in to your channel occasionally, but I never fully believed in all of this stuff. To me, it was just fun to listen to and think about, but that was about it. However, I had a particularly bizarre experience this past week. And I've been kind of stuck on what I now believe, basically at a loss as to what's the truth. But I realize that you and your audience are the best people to tell this to. I'm writing this from a bed and breakfast in Western Massachusetts. My husband and I came here on vacation to see the local art museums and to visit with his family. My husband grew up in the suburbs of Boston, but his family went on vacation in the Berkshires all the time. We were both feeling burnt out from city life and considering buying a house with some land. But the main purpose of this visit was just to de-stress and get the lay of the land. We arrived at the bed and breakfast late in the evening. We had booked the small cabin behind the main house. It was a charming, cozy spot that had everything we needed. Just walking in it, I could take deeper breaths. I was so thrilled that I would get to relax a bit and it would be a good time to think about our next steps. That night, when my husband was in the shower, I was lying in bed looking at Zillow properties that would be in our pay grade. It was raining steadily, and we had spent the evening watching old movies. I lost track of Zillow and the shower noises and the rain outside, and I found myself just staring into space. One of those moments where you think about everything and nothing at the same time. Fully present and at the same time, 150 feet above your body. And this is when I heard the tapping noises. It sounded like something was tapping on the window. I looked over to the window to see if that was the case, but didn't see anything. The rain was still falling, but it had faded to the background. I had renewed interest in my surroundings now, and I began wandering around the cabin looking to all the windows. There had to be a source of this strange tapping that had just suddenly started. At first, I couldn't see anything that would illuminate the source of the noise. Maybe I was imagining things. Something bouncing around in my subconscious. But then, I saw it. This is a prank. That was my first thought. But in the bottom corner window pane, I saw a tiny little hand tapping the glass of the front window by the porch. I must have jumped up a foot. I sat back down, scooting myself as far as I could away towards the opposite wall. I could do nothing else but stare at the window. The finger was stubby and short, and the hand that it belonged to was shriveled like the root of a tree. It tapped in a simple rhythm in threes. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. This went on for another 30 seconds. Felt like an eternity to me. The tapping eventually ceased and the hand disappeared with a gentle slide along the glass of the window. I took some deep breaths and I did a little inventory of what I could have possibly seen. Mustering up some courage, I decided to step out onto the porch to see what I could find. Nothing seemed out of place. My husband came out of the shower and saw that I was tense and now back sitting on the bed. He asked if I was alright. I told him I was fine. 
was very reluctant to share what I had just seen because I didn't fully believe it myself. Eventually we went to bed, and needless to say, I had a difficult time falling asleep. So I ended up rolling around and looking at my phone. I eventually rolled onto my shoulder and looked out the window once again, and to my shock, that same lower corner window pane now had a pair of bright yellow eyes staring in through it. They were human in appearance, and staring directly towards us. I sat straight up, shocked at what I was seeing. As I looked longer, I realized that the eyes were part of a wrinkled little face, and instead of hair on top of its head were these several short spikes. Summoning up some bravery, I got out of bed and I walked towards the front door of the cabin. The thing in the window seemed to nod and smile when I did this. I don't know what prompted me to get up, I just put my jacket on and walked outside. But once I did so, I looked around. It was gone. There was just some rustling noises in the woods nearby. I walked towards the noise, looking around for this little creature. Eventually I saw those same eyes in the distance up in a tree, so I ended up hiking to the top of this hill where those were. Once I was close to the tree, I stopped and looked up at the creature. I then took a few steps forward, hoping to get a little closer, to see it better. My gaze was up towards the tree, locked in a stare with the creature, so much so that I didn't notice I was walking towards the edge of a cliff. Because of the trance that it had me in, I nearly fell to what would have been a serious injury. I looked back at the yellow eyes in the tree. They blinked. And then the creature crawled up the tree and disappeared. This is when I seemed to come back to my senses, and I hightailed it back to the cabin, jumped back into bed. I have no idea how my husband didn't wake during all of this, which is almost what scared me the most. Did this creature have him in some kind of a trance, too? I then looked at the clock. Only ten minutes had passed. Did this even really happen? I decided to relay it all to my husband as if it had been a dream, and then I just decided to go with that in my own head, too. Since then, the trip has been completely normal, at least up until right now as I sit here writing this to you. No more sightings of that little creature. I've been a little nervous, though, traveling around up here, trying to keep my wits about me to make sure that I'm not led off somewhere where I shouldn't be led. I hope this story is interesting to you and your audience, and a reminder to all of you to be careful out there. In the woods, there are so many things that we don't understand. I have always been a nature enthusiast and adventurer, constantly seeking new experiences outdoors. So when I decided to embark on a solo trip to Acadia National Park, I was thrilled at the prospect of exploring the beautiful wilderness of Maine. Little did I know that my trip would turn into a nightmare one that I would never forget. It was the third night of my trip, and I had set up camp in a secluded area of the park. The sun had just set as I was settling in for the night. Before long, I heard a rustling in the bushes nearby. I assumed it was just a deer or some other harmless animal, so I didn't pay it much attention. But as the rustling continued, I began to feel uneasy. Suddenly, a massive creature emerged from the bushes. It stood at least ten feet tall with shaggy fur that seemed to absorb the moonlight. Its eyes were a piercing blue, glowing with a fierce intensity. Its face was a cross between a wolf and a bear, with razor-sharp teeth that glinted in the darkness. Its arms were long and muscular, ending in huge paws with razor-sharp claws. My heart was pounding in my chest as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. The creature let out a low growl, and I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing up. It was like a primal instinct had kicked in, telling me that I was in grave danger. As the creature charged towards me with incredible speed, I scrambled to grab my backpack, fumbling with the zipper in my panic. I knew that I had to get out of there fast if I wanted to survive. The creature was almost upon me, its massive jaws gaping open as it prepared to strike. But just as it was about to pounce, it suddenly stopped, as if it had hit an invisible wall. It then let out a deafening roar that echoed through the park before disappearing back into the darkness. I was left there, shaken, terrified, 
wondering what had just happened. It was like a dream that I couldn't shake off, but the claw marks on the trees and the gouges in the ground were evidence that it had been real. Over the next few days, I tried to make sense of what I had seen. I talked to rangers and other hikers, hoping for some kind of explanation. Some said that it was just a mystical creature from legend passed down from Native American folklore, while others insisted that it was a real creature that roamed the wilderness. As for me, I knew that I had encountered something that was beyond my understanding. It was a creature that was both terrifying and awe-inspiring, a testament to the raw power of nature. And while I'll never forget the fear that I felt that night in Acadia National Park, I will always cherish the memory of that incredible experience. The next story I'm sharing here is so insane that the woman who shared it has asked to be referred to by the name of Michelle, which isn't her real name. She says that the encounter was so intense that she hasn't shared it with anyone, mainly because she doesn't want to take the chance of having to live with the stigma of being called that woman. The encounter starts by Michelle leaving her house on the morning of November 19, 2003 for her daily run before work. It was early morning and an unusually warm morning for November in Michigan, which can be very cold, especially where she lived in East Lansing in an apartment near Michigan State University. The sun had just started to peak over the horizon, which meant that the temperatures would now slowly start to creep upwards. At this time, the streets were still mostly deserted with only a few cars driving by every now and then, which was exactly how Michelle liked it. Mornings like this were what kept her head clear and sane. She had a usual route that she ran and her body could do it on autopilot. She ran along the road because it had a sidewalk and felt safe. This particular day, she was deep in thought as her feet rhythmically hit the ground, thinking of a vacation that she had coming up with a group of girls, when all of a sudden she heard commotion in a grouping of bushes nearby. Now ordinarily, strange noises wouldn't have fazed her since she's always been more of a city girl, and she knew that it was usually best to ignore strange noises and just move away from them quickly. But this noise was different. It sounded large, like whatever was making the noise was big. Michelle quickly remembered the flyers she saw in her apartment building by the mailboxes for a neighbor's missing dog, which had last been seen three days ago. Her first thought was wondering if it could be that dog. She knew she had to check. She couldn't forgive herself if she didn't. And so she quickly stopped and tried to peer behind the bushes, trying to see what was making the noise. As she leaned forward, trying to get a better view, Suddenly, out of the shadows stepped this very large, wolf-like creature. It was easily as big as a full-grown man, and it was now standing completely upright and staring at her. Michelle stood there, with her eyes wide as saucers. She could see that it was the size of a very large German shepherd standing on its long back legs, with a long neck, large furry head, and fur-covered arms that hung lower than seemed to be normal. But of course, nothing about this was normal. Its fur was light brown with some black mixed in. She remembers wishing she had mace on her. She clearly felt danger emanating from the creature. It then began to slowly walk towards her and then just stopped, stood there, staring at her for an amount of time that seemed like forever. And then the wind began to pick up and the scent of the creature hit her. It was rank, putrid, a smell that made her nauseous. Eventually, it turned around and walked away into the woods, leaving Michelle standing there, completely dumbfounded, watching it as it melted back into the darkness from the direction it had come. Michelle remained frozen in place for a few moments after the creature disappeared, and then she immediately abandoned the rest of her run and turned around to make her way back home, trying to make sense of what she had seen, but also trying not to think about it so that she could get herself home safely. The whole way back, she tried to tell herself that it was just a large dog, but she knew that wasn't the truth. It had been too big, too feral, too much like a werewolf. And then before getting too far, she thought about turning around to try and see if she really had just experienced this creature. But she quickly realized 
that that was a really bad idea considering she was alone and it was so early in the morning. The rest of the neighborhood was likely still asleep, so she abandoned that idea for now, but told herself that one day she would go back looking to try to find whatever it was that she had seen. As she started off back home, she could still smell the creature, and then off in the distance, she thought she heard a howl, a howl that sounded almost human, and then additional howls that sounded like they were coming from the same direction. She ran home as fast as she could, not wanting to be caught out in the open if that thing came back. When she got back to her house, she quickly locked all of her doors and windows, making sure everything was secure, and then called the police. It took a while for them to arrive, and by the time they did, the sun was up, and she could see their cruiser pull into the driveway. Michelle ran out to meet them and recounted her story to the officers, but they didn't seem too concerned. They told her they would head over to the area she mentioned and look around. They also promised to look into it and see if anybody else in the neighborhood had reported anything similar, but she never heard back from them, and she decided not to reach back out. She figured that they wouldn't find anything anyway, because whatever she had seen that morning was long gone by now. She was sure of it. She was convinced that it was smart enough to know that it shouldn't be seen by the light of day. The whole incident left her feeling unsettled and she began to feel like she was being watched. She was careful to lock her doors and windows every night, but still, every time she went outside, she felt like eyes were on her, judging her, waiting for her. And not only from the creature, but she felt self-conscious that people knew her story and were now judging her when they saw her. The encounter was basically eating away at her self-confidence and even her sanity. But she never did see the creature again, and eventually, she convinced herself that it had all just been a dream. A very vivid dream at that, because the alternative, believing in it, was just too difficult. So now, even years later, she still hears those howls sometimes, now mostly in her dreams. And she still lets the thoughts into her mind that it might, might, just might have been real. I've lived on this ranch here in North Dakota my entire life. In fact, my great-grandfather settled this land. His family came over from the old country in the mid-1800s, so you could say I know it like the back of my hand. The truth is that my entire life I've been hearing strange stories of a creature that supposedly haunts these parts. It's said to be a giant black dog, or sometimes a wolf-like creature. In fact, My grandfather used to tell me stories of how when he was a boy, his father would take him out hunting these creatures, but they never found one. Supposedly, they are quite smart and very dangerous. It's been said that the creature is some sort of a demon or a spirit that's been trapped on our land. Others say it's just a regular animal or a weird hybrid that's made its home in the dense forests that are nearby. Either way, I always make sure to be extra careful when I'm out at night, but this is just part of the legend of this place, and I never thought much of it since I've been hearing it since I was a boy. Until, one night, everything changed. One summer night about a decade ago, I was out checking on the horses in the barn. The night was still, but you could still hear the rustlings of spring and the movements of animals in the trees. It had always been my job to make sure everything was as it should be before bed, and so I was out, diligently doing my duties. Now to give you a clear vision, the barn is over a hundred years old, but it had been built so solidly from rocks dug up from our land that it will no doubt be standing for long into the future, probably long after I'm gone. However, despite its solid foundation, the wooden plank walls have a few cracks between the boards and those can let in moonlight, and they always give the inside of the barn this eerie glow. That was the one thing I hated about checking on the barn at night. So anyway, as I was walking through the barn for one less check, I heard a noise coming from the far end. Like a loud shriek, but quick, and almost gone by the time I tuned into it. It had come from the opposite end of the barn from where I had entered. I knew it wasn't the ranch hands or any of the other workers because they were all finished for the night. I had even said goodnight to some of them and teased one about getting up on time in the morning. So, 
I knew for sure that they weren't there. The noise was familiar, and yet strange at the same time. I thought maybe one of my horses had been spooked or was kicking up a fuss. I had brought our family dog Bruno. I did that every night just to be safe, because he's fiercely protective and loyal. The full moon that night made it so that I could see most everything, even though I was totally spooked as I walked through those streams of light coming in from between the boards. I inched slowly along, looking left and right, and trying to decipher what I had heard and what was going on in there. So, as soon as I got closer to the opposite side, I heard the noise again, and I verified that I was getting closer. It was definitely coming from the far back part of the barn, which is also the area where the horses were sounding really upset. So now I'm thinking that maybe a coyote or something had gotten inside and spooked them. But I wasn't seeing one, or any signs of one. I stood there and tried to focus as best as possible towards the sound, still being helped by the light streaming into the barn and peeking through the cracks in a way that almost made the barn look like it was alive. I watched as the dust swirled through the moonlight, adding to my strange feelings. And I remember wishing that this was all over, and that it had been nothing. At this point, I turned on the flashlight I had brought, and I got a good look at the horses. I could now see their eyes, and they were all moving around in panic, looking agitated in their stalls with their eyes open wide and bulging. I knew from the looks on their faces that I needed to be careful because something dangerous was definitely lurking around. And then I heard Bruno growling, and I turned towards him to see him standing in the front of an open doorway of one of the smaller stalls. His hackles were raised and his teeth were bared. I stepped forward to see what he was growling at, and there, in the beam of light from my flashlight, I saw the most horrifying creature that I have ever seen in my life. It was standing there, just inside the stall, its eyes glowing a bright, sinister, amberish color. It was easily the size of a horse, and it had this long snout with sharp teeth and black fur that was matted and greasy. This was definitely something wild or feral. It just didn't match up with anything that one would normally find in a barn stall, even including wild animals that might break in for the night. Of course, my brain went on overload and I couldn't process what I was seeing. So for a few moments, I just stood there, paralyzed with fear. I thought for sure that this wild and rough-looking creature was going to lunge at me, either to hurt me or to get past me. I mean, it had no other direction to go. I could definitely feel that this situation was not good at all. But as soon as it saw me, it locked eyes with me, and then it stood up straighter than before, on its hind legs and I watched it grow taller than I ever thought possible. And now I could see it more clearly because my light was shining right in its face. It had reddish-brown fur and that long snout. This creature was not anything I had ever seen before, at least not in person. The most disorienting part was its eyes that glowed back at me, reflecting the beam from my flashlight in a way that could practically slice the darkness and the thing had this look of pure evil on its face. It didn't take me long to realize that I was looking at the creature that up until now had just been a legend to me. I knew that it was the creature from the stories, from the history of this land. I remember noticing that I couldn't breathe and that my heart was pounding so hard that it felt like it was trying to escape my chest. I wanted to run, but my feet felt like they were glued to the floor. Somewhere in the back of my mind... As if I was hearing it through water, I could hear Bruno still barking, but I couldn't tell you where he was if my life depended on it. The only thing that I could do was stand there and stare at this thing, with my mind swirling. It just stood there looking back at me, and then it did something that I will never forget, that I will never be able to explain. It tilted its head to the side, and it just looked at me for a long moment, and then it jumped right out of the stall over the wall and past me and into the empty stall next to it, and then it sprinted out of the barn. It literally scaled the stall wall and practically flew through the air, towards the open doors. I spun to watch it run as my flashlight shone on its back with the streams of moonlight flickering on its fur as it ran through them, and then it was gone. I don't know what made me do it, but I ran after it. My legs just took off without me consciously deciding to go. I sprinted out of the barn in the direction that it had run, 
I even called out for it to stop. Bruno was with me, barking the whole time. But the thing was gone. Even he couldn't follow its scent. I ran all around the ranch looking for signs of it, but I couldn't find anything. It had just vanished into the night. After about ten minutes of watching for it to reappear, I admitted to myself that it was gone. It had outwitted us, and it had gotten away without a trace. Even the horses seemed to be calming down a bit as if they sensed it was gone too. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that this thing was still watching us, waiting for its chance to come back. It was the stillness of the night that made me feel that way. Sounds in the trees had stopped, and now there was just this eerie silence in the land. Bruno and I eventually went inside the house and I locked all the doors. No surprise, I didn't sleep much that night. The next morning, I went out to check on the property again to see if I could find some clues. I found footprints, big prints in the soft earth near the barn, but they stopped at the edge of the property, and then nothing. No more clues. I still have no idea what happened that night in the barn, but I know that it was real. I know that I wasn't dreaming and that I didn't imagine it. I saw the creature with my own eyes, and it was definitely not anything friendly. It was a wild animal, a predator. It wanted to kill something? I'm sure of it. In a way, I'm almost glad that I saw this thing. It's really made me more alert and careful. I'm extra cautious now too, and I don't leave anything to chance. I feel that I and my family and the ranch are all safer now because of my heightened caution. I know it's strange to feel safer after seeing one of these, but if you live the life I do, taking care of so many living creatures, it's good to know exactly what you're up against. But still, I'll never forget that night in the barn and the terror that I felt as I watched it standing there, just looking at me. I can honestly state that horrifying creatures do exist. And they're out there, waiting in the dark. I've been excited to share my story with you because I think it's a bit different than all the rest I've ever heard. You see... Even though I have had several encounters with some really strange things in my life that I can't really put into words, I have never been afraid of them. I feel protected by them, actually. But one day in the fall of 2015, I had an encounter that was a little different from those others, mainly because of how the thing I encountered acted towards me. At the time, I was 20 years old and I lived in a house on the outskirts of Saugus, California. I had left my parents' home and I was renting this place with two other girls, one whose name was Roxy. It was about one o'clock in the morning and Roxy and I were driving home after going to see some friends play at a music festival down near LA. I was driving because Roxy's car was in the shop and anyway, she always liked when I drove. We were blasting music while we drove when suddenly she said, hey, what's that? At first I didn't know what she meant, but I saw her looking back. So I glanced in the rearview mirror, and then I saw it too. Something moving behind us along the side of the highway, darting in and out next to the guardrail. It looked like a big dog or maybe even a coyote, but why that didn't make sense was that it was walking on two legs, and it was fast. It was keeping pace with us, even though it was staying about 50 yards behind. I slowed down a bit so we could get a better look and see what was exactly going on. And that's when I heard Roxy yell, It's coming at us! Sure enough, the thing started running even more quickly, towards our car now that we were slowing down. And the image that really sticks in my mind about this part was that it looked like it was grinning, smiling, or maybe it was smirking in a way it knew it had the upper hand. I'm not sure why it was making that expression, but either way, the way its mouth looked was insane. And just as we were trying to get a good look at it, it passed under one of the big lights along the side of the road. And I could see that this thing was not a normal animal at all. I could now even see horns that I hadn't been able to make out when it was further back. I know that sounds crazy, but they looked like goat horns. And like I said, this thing was tall, with dark brown fur all over its body except for the white parts of skin that were showing in some spots, like around the eyes. Another confusing part was that I could now see that it was running actually on its toes. And when I say that, I mean it looked like it was running with its feet pointed down, or maybe like it had hooves or something like that. 
All I could think was that this thing had come straight from the devil. Later, Roxy said that she had had the same thought, which makes me think we might have been correct about that, even though I don't know how we both had the same random thought at the same time. One thing is for sure, though, it scared the hell out of both of us, especially when it started to make strange sounds. At first, I thought it was growling, but then I realized that the sounds were not growls, but they had some sort of a regulated cadence. I honestly then thought that this creature was speaking to me in some unknown language. At least, unknown to me. Roxy said she could hear it too, but all she heard were buzzing sounds, and she couldn't decide if it was actually a language or not. But whatever this thing did with its voice made my car shake, and it made it difficult for me to stay in control. It was at this point that I floored it, and I sped off as fast as I could back to our house. Once we got home, Roxy ran inside to use the bathroom, and she barfed everywhere. She was so sick from what had happened. But for whatever reason, I now wasn't scared. I was actually excited. Roxy thought I was crazy, and she made that very clear as we told our other roommate what had happened. But as we told her, she became super worried that something might have followed us home and she couldn't stop thinking that it could be lurking around the house. I thought that idea was crazy, but she seemed scared enough that we all went outside to check. We went with flashlights, and we looked all over the place. I even kept my mace in my hand just in case, but we didn't see anything unusual. However, we did hear strange noises coming from the hillside across the street. It sounded like a cross between a dog barking and this weird moaning sound. The whole thing freaked us out, so we all went back inside and locked up tight for the night. A few days later, Roxy got her car back from the shop and started driving herself places again. She then told me that while she was driving home one night from work, she saw that same creature standing on top of a hill near where we had seen it before. She said it was just standing there, looking at her, and she had to drive past it and hold it together hoping the whole time that it didn't react to her or recognize her. Obviously, I don't know why that thing was there, but I'm glad Roxy got through it okay. As for me, I haven't seen that devil creature again since that night, but I do feel the presence of some really strange energies in the area around our house. I'm convinced that I'm sensing that creature's presence. I'm sort of like that anyway, really sensitive to energies and such. And not really afraid, just curious. Thanks for listening to the story. If you want, you can use my name, which is Christine, on your site. And if you think it's okay and safe to do that. I look forward to seeing if you post this or not. And what other people think about it. I live in a very suburban neighborhood in northern Michigan that's just like any neighborhood, really. We had chosen the house because it's on a cul-de-sac and it was safe for the kids to play outside. The rear of the house backs up to a natural open space area, which was another plus for us so we could take the kids on nature walks. What we didn't know when we moved in was that our neighbor to the west of us seemed a little strange. He was very paranoid all the time. He had an abnormal number of motion sensor lights on his house, and his window blinds always seemed to be closed. He even had a strand of barbed wire all along the top of his backyard fence. The first time I met him, he was outside putting salt around his house. He was lugging around a 10-pound bag of coarse salt. We had barely introduced ourselves, and he was trying to give me some salt, too. He said you never know when the horned beast will come back. I thought then that maybe he was some kind of religious fanatic and was talking about the devil. But he said he had noticed these footprints in his backyard the last time it snowed, and that was when he put up the barbed wire. So it sounded like he was talking about a physical beast. I tried to ask him some questions, but he said it wasn't good to talk about it too much. I don't like to judge, but I figured he had lost a few marbles. I know that some of my own relatives have gotten a little weird when they've been cooped up for so long. One evening I was in the kitchen cooking or doing dishes when I heard this low rumbling sound. I turned around and I saw my 60 pound bull terrier facing the door to the backyard, growling like I had never seen him do before. His hackles were fully raised and his body was rigid and shaking. 
His lips were curled, and he was baring all of his teeth. He was taking in these big breaths and snarling. I'd never seen him like that before. I'd seen him bark and growl at neighborhood cats, but nothing like this. He's mostly muscle. He looked really intimidating. I was thinking, what the hell is out there? I was home alone, so there shouldn't have been anybody out there. So I grabbed a big kitchen knife, and I opened the door a bit. When the door was about halfway open, I was hit with this horrible, rotting meat smell. My mind was scrambling for a reason. I started thinking, did the lids get blown off the garbage cans? But no way would the garbage cans ever smell like that. Not that bad. And I hadn't put anything like that in them. It was a truly putrid smell. I figured I'd better get out there to check it out, though. If some animal had gotten stuck in my yard, I didn't want it tearing anything up. And anyway, my poor dog needed to calm down. It was around dusk, so I could see out there a little, but it was verging on pretty dark. I poked my head out the door, and I heard a rustling sound and the sound of branches breaking. I looked toward the back fence, and I thought I saw antlers. Well, we had tons of deer in the area, and they often were out at dusk, so that wasn't anything unusual. But the rustling noise kept going, so I was wondering if maybe it had gotten its antlers stuck in the fence. I didn't feel capable of releasing a trapped deer, but I couldn't just ignore it, especially with my dog going nuts. Now that was weird because he was used to seeing deer all the time. I wanted to get a closer look before I called animal rescue in case I was wrong. I managed to squeeze out the door without letting the dog out, but when I got out there, the dog went even more ballistic. He was actually jumping up and clawing at the door like he was trying to tear it down. Now that should have clued me in, because my dog does not act like that. He's a big lovable goof. Listen to your dogs, people. My backyard slopes up to the back fence, which is about 60 feet from the back door. So I started walking up there, and when I got within 20 feet, I just stopped dead in my tracks. There were definitely antlers, but it definitely was not a deer. This antlered head turned toward me and looked at me with these horrible yellow eyes. The eyes were like glowing out of these hollow sockets, and the head looked like some kind of skull. It looked like it had the legs of a deer, but it was standing upright, and it was tall. At least seven feet tall. It was so skinny, too, and it looked so unreal, but I'm telling you, it was real. Looking at it, I felt icy cold, even though it wasn't cold outside. While it was looking at me, I just felt hollowed out somehow. Hopeless. I managed to turn around and run back into the house. I got in the door and I had to use all my strength to hold my dog back and slam the door and lock it. I fell to the ground and just sobbed into my dog's fur. He was still lunging and barking his head off, but I just held on to him tight. After about five minutes, he finally did calm down. I turned on the backyard floodlights and looked out there, through the window. It seemed to be gone. I couldn't even think. There was no reference in my brain for such a thing. Do you have any idea what it was? I had been working as a park ranger at Little Buffalo State Park in central Pennsylvania for about six months when I had my encounter. It was August of 2006. My partner and I were driving around the park at night to do a final check of the area for the evening. We were about halfway through our section of the park when we got a call from dispatch saying that there was a camper who wanted us to come out and take a look at his RV because he thought it had been vandalized or broken into. I told dispatch no problem and that we would be there shortly. We turned our vehicle around and we arrived at this campsite within five minutes or so, and there we found a gentleman in his mid-sixties, standing outside his RV and looking very nervous. He walked up to our truck as we pulled up, quickly opening the passenger door and asked if we could please take a look at his camper. His behavior was very unusual, and so we cautiously agreed and walked over to the camper with him, following closely behind. He was very nervous, and he kept looking around the entire time almost like he was expecting something to jump out at him. I took a quick look inside the camper and found nothing that appeared to be out of place or missing. 
I asked him if anything had been taken from inside, and he said no, but that there were some things that he thought were moved around during the short time he was gone. I looked around for another minute or so before telling him that we didn't see anything wrong, and we thanked him for calling us, and then we started walking back towards the truck. And that's when my partner, who is an avid hunter, said to me, Do you smell that? I stopped walking for a second because I honestly didn't notice any kind of odor other than the normal smell of a state park campground. Mildew, pine needles, etc. My partner has spent many hours in the woods, so he knows his smells. He told me that it smelled like something was trying to cover up its own scent. And now that he said that, that's when I noticed it too. It was a very light odor, but definitely there. We looked around for another minute or so before my partner said, I think we need to get out of here. We took our truck and drove off towards the main area of the park, which is about one mile away from where we were at the campsite. We navigated our way up a path, and as soon as we got onto the main road that travels through the park, we both saw it. We saw what looked like a seven to eight foot tall creature walking along the road. I was driving, so I didn't get a good look at it, but my partner saw it walk out into the road in front of us and then quickly cross to the other side where there's more vegetation and trees. He said that he could only see the backside as it walked across the road, but that it had very wide shoulders, almost too wide for its body. And he also said that he thought he could see long black hair covering its arms and shoulders, but he wasn't sure because it was dark. We drove around looking for this thing for about an hour after that, trying to pinpoint it, with no luck finding anything else unusual. So we eventually gave up and returned to the office. The next day, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I went back to the site by myself in hopes of finding any evidence of what we saw or smelled there before, but we found nothing out of place or unusual in any way. I decided to just move on and not focus on it since no concrete evidence could be found. But I've heard of other encounters in this area as well, which makes me believe that there is something going on out here, for sure. Also, there have been sightings reported from this area all the way over to Harrisburg. Anyway, that's my story. I'm not here to convince anybody that what I saw was real, but I know that what I saw and smelled was real. Also, there have been several reports of dead deer in the area. Deer that are torn apart, but not eaten. Now that's very unusual to say the least. So I'm wondering if this is all connected somehow. The most common theory among hunters around here is that something is killing deer just for sport, and then covering up its tracks or scent with another odor to mask its own. I can't quite figure out how that would work, but that's what some people are saying. In the end, I'm not sure exactly what I think is going on, but I really am glad to have you to tell this to. Thank you for being here for me to share this with. I remember that it was a muggy day in August in the mid-80s. I think it was around 1986. My mom and I were driving from our home in Rochester, Indiana, to Michigan to visit my grandmother for a few days. I was around 17 years old at the time, and I remember that I had just gotten my license. So even though the trip would take about three hours, this was a good trip for me to get some experience on the highway. We'd been on the road for more than an hour when we approached a set of railroad tracks that crossed over the two-lane highway. I believe we were on Highway 31, but I'm not 100% sure. As we got closer to the crossing, I noticed something large and dark moving along the tree line on the far side of the tracks. It was weird because it seemed to be following parallel with us as we drove north, basically moving along with us, but ahead of us and within the trees. Now my mom is a very observant person, especially when it comes to animals. She's always been able to identify any type of animal she saw by its movements alone. That made her more than qualified in my eyes as somebody who could identify what this thing could be. She noticed it instantly without me even saying anything. And as we approached the tracks, she asked me to slow down even more so that she could get a better look at it. 
As I slowed down, my mom turned in her seat and leaned way out of the passenger window to get a better view of whatever it was. And as she did this, I watched from my vantage point in the driver's seat as something large and dark sprinted from behind a tree, across the railroad tracks, and into another patch of trees on the other side. It covered quite a bit of ground in just a few seconds, which made me wonder exactly how big this thing was. Like, how long were its legs that it was able to do that? And why did it reveal itself to us if even for that split second? My mom sat back in her seat after it disappeared into the trees and said, I have no idea what that was, but it sure looked like a bear. I mean, it was furry and huge, but way bigger than a bear to me. I agreed with her somewhat, but I was also thinking it may have been some kind of a wolf or a large dog. I felt that it was definitely a large animal, but much larger than any dog I had ever seen. It had dark fur and it appeared to be very muscular based on the way the body moved as it sprinted across the railroad tracks. To be honest, its movement was similar to that of a cheetah's in that it covered ground quickly. But the insane part was that it had been running on two legs and was that fast. I think that's the part that really had us wondering what was going on. My mom and I just looked at each other for a few moments after it disappeared, not really knowing what to do. We were both in shock at what we had seen. But then after a few minutes, my mom said she wanted to go back and retrace our last 500 feet or so of the drive to take another look and be sure that there wasn't just something out there that had messed with our brains, like a dead tree or a brush blowing around. I was hesitant, and I knew in my heart that there was no real logical explanation for this. It felt real, but not real all at the same time, which was terrifying and I didn't want to get close to whatever that thing was. But my mom was insistent, and so I turned the car around and slowly drove back. When we got back to where we had been, we instead stopped the car and got out for a closer look. There was no sign of an animal anywhere. No footprints, no fur, nothing. It was as if it had just vanished. And that's when we heard a noise that I will never forget. It sounded like a woman screaming coming from the trees where we had seen the animal disappear. We both just looked at each other, not knowing what to do. My mom said, it's time to go. We got back in the car and drove off as fast as we could. I gunned the car as we passed the spot where we had last seen it, hoping and praying it would not show itself again. Luckily, it all went well, and we got past that section of trees safely, and we were able to continue on to my grandmother's. We didn't say much to each other after that. I think we were both still in shock from what we had seen and heard, thinking in our own minds about what had just happened. We mentioned it to my grandma, but she didn't seem to take us too seriously. She was kind, but basically moved on to another subject rather quickly. That sort of woke us up, and we never talked about it again after that day, other than to each other. To this day, I still have no idea what we saw. I know one thing for sure. It was definitely not a bear or a dog. At least, not one that we know of. I got to work late the night that this happened. Or actually, it's more accurate to say very early that morning. I get in an hour before everybody else and it was 5 o'clock in the morning on a cold February day in 2017. I worked in Burlington County, New Jersey, basically right across the river from Philadelphia. When it's late and quiet like that, the parking lot seems like a ghost town. But of course, it's not really abandoned. There are still a few cars here and there, but other employees don't really start coming in until about 6. Anyway, this early morning shift usually goes by quickly, but the last few nights hadn't passed fast enough. It had been nothing to do with how busy we've been, but more due to all the strange things that have been happening around the shop lately. Things missing, and windows broken. But we work in a warehouse that gets deliveries all night long, so it's important that somebody is there, which means I couldn't call off. Because of all the oddities happening, some of my co-workers even begged me not to come in alone. But it's hard to find anybody else willing to work that shift. So there I was, alone again that night, 
and all their talk honestly had me a bit scared and wondering what new problems might await me beyond the big metal doors to the delivery area. It was probably my own paranoia and all the speculation stories on danger, because there's really no proof of anything really dangerous happening. Just a few broken windows that could be blamed on any number of things, like kids or drunks. Well, there was those missing tools, but they were never reported because they're always gone. We're always ordering more. Something that I think makes us look incompetent at work. I've always thought that somebody who works there might just be stealing them. Anyway, that tingling sensation was coming down my back as I pulled into the parking lot. You know, the kind that keeps you from being able to focus. I told myself that tonight will be different, though. Tonight will pass by quickly because I'll stay busy and nothing will happen. Well, in the end, the night didn't pass any faster than normal. And luckily, everything did seem normal. Until the incident happened. Out of the corner of my eye, while on the forklift sorting supplies onto shelves, I saw something quickly pass by outside one of the broken windows. It was a fleeting moment, but I could tell that it was something huge and quick, which seemed like a strange combination. I stopped working and I stared out the window. I kept looking trying to see what was there when I noticed the same movement again, this time disappearing around the side of the building. It moved quickly, and it was higher than the window, so whatever it was must have been very tall, at least seven or eight feet. Its height was weird enough, but I swear I saw what looked like an arm hanging down too, and dark colored, but I couldn't tell exactly because it was still so dark outside. Soon after, I was sure I heard somebody rattling the entry door, so naturally I panicked and I drove the forklift as fast as I could toward a large open space where I didn't feel so vulnerable. I wanted to get away from those windows just in case, but I also knew that the noise of the machine would alert whoever it was. Not only that I was in the building, but they would know exactly where I was. I was really freaking out now, but telling myself it was probably just the same person who steals the tools. Weird to think that a thief was my best case scenario at this point. I waited for a while to see if there was any further movement or sound, but when no one came into the building, I realized it must have just been one of the co-workers parking and entering the front door, the door I couldn't see from the warehouse. Sure enough, before long, my co-worker John walked into the delivery from the front office. He looked barely awake and he seemed to be heading to the break room for coffee. I tried to play cool and asked if he needed any help with anything but he said nothing and walked right past me like usual, not even looking up or saying hello. Again, it's odd, but not that unusual for him. I was just happy that somebody else had actually showed up and that I wasn't alone. We both got to work with me continuing to sort supplies and him doing his usual, straightening up the delivery area. Just like before, I kept finding myself staring out the broken windows, trying to catch another glimpse of whatever it was that I saw. Or thought I saw. It had to be nothing, right? It had to be my imagination getting the best of me. There's definitely no weird creature like that out there. At least I kept telling myself. After a few hours, I went to the bathroom, and when I came back, John was gone. I wasn't entirely sure where he had gone. He usually tells me, and the rules are for one person to always be on the floor. So I was a little freaked out that he was nowhere in sight. I called his name a few times in case he was on the far side of the building, but no answer. Anyway, I kept it together and I kept sorting supplies until I heard the door open again. It was John, standing in the doorway, but then he ran back outside. The look on his face told me instantly that something was wrong. He was clearly in a panic, and this wasn't the same calm and cool John that I usually saw every day at work. He called out to me. He sounded desperate something about a dog and a creature outside the building. My heart skipped a beat when he said the word dog. I instantly followed him outside, but I didn't see anything. Nothing was different from before, and it seemed like nothing was out there. But John kept calling for my help, and he sounded like he needed it badly. Like when you think somebody's being attacked, or when they're in some kind of trouble, like drowning or something. I didn't know what to think, but John sounded in serious trouble 
so I ran out into the parking lot to help him. He was screaming about a dog. He was staring off into the woods with the building behind him, and as I got closer, I realized the word that he was saying was dog man. And I realized that he thought a dog man was out there in the woods. But boy, was he wrong. From where I stood, I was between John and the building. I could see that the creature was actually 20 steps behind him and walking towards him. Neither of them was looking back at me, and I'm not convinced they even knew I was there. From behind, the creature looked more dog-like than man in terms of the matted fur. But the thing was walking towards John on two legs, which was something my brain was not computing. And then the creature stopped and turned and looked at me. It seemed to notice me. And then it did something that makes my blood turn cold when I think about it. It opened its mouth and barked at me. Only it wasn't really a bark. It was screaming at me with a sound that I will never forget. It stared me straight in the eyes and snapped its mouth shut, gritting its fangs and then growling a low, guttural growl. One that seemed to rumble the earth. We stood there in a standstill with it staring at me, me staring at it. Was it waiting for me to make a move? Who knows? I wasn't even able to do anything but stand there. And then it spun around and ran, ran past John without even pausing as it passed him, and headed to the woods where John was watching. My brain could not process what had just happened. It made no sense at all. All I could do was watch it run away. John was somehow more lucid than I was after the whole thing. I was confused why it didn't attack me or him, but John wasn't in a state of mind to care about that. He didn't need to know why. He was just happy that it didn't happen. He kept reassuring me that it would be okay, telling me it's gone now and we're safe now. I wanted to believe him, but it didn't make any sense why it ran away like that. From what I was seeing, it totally had the advantage, and there wasn't any good explanation for its retreat. It came down to my wondering if it just didn't want to kill us, or was it scared of something? Something I didn't know about. Maybe it just got caught up in the whole situation and didn't even mean to be there. Maybe it did some weird reconnaissance on us and it ran away when it found out we weren't worthy of prey. Or it smelled another of its kind nearby. Or something else as equally horrifying. Now all I can do is wonder if this creature, or its tribe if that exists, has anything to do with our broken windows and missing tools. The thought of an armed and dangerous group of dog creatures near the shop is enough to keep me up at night, and away from the night shift. Yeah, I finally listened to my co-workers, and I stopped working the night shift. Anyway, now it's been weeks, and the thing has not shown up again. I think it moved on, or it's just waiting for the next best opportunity. Interestingly, no more tools have disappeared either. It was my first time in La Grande, Oregon. I had never been to these woods before, and so I was not familiar with the area. I was out visiting and hiking with a friend, and we were trying to find a trail that she had seen on a map. We weren't having much luck, and we were getting a little frustrated. We were in the woods for about an hour and a half, but not finding what we had headed there for. And so we were getting ready to head back to the car. It was getting late, too, and the sun was setting. At this point, we were walking along a creek bed, and we were looking for a way out of the woods, since we had gotten ourselves pretty turned around. We were walking along the edge of the creek when I noticed something dark in the woods about 50 feet away. I told my friend to stop and be quiet so I could listen and check it out. I also looked through my binoculars, and what I saw was a big black mass. I couldn't make out any features or details, though. I couldn't tell if it was an animal or a pile of brush or even a person at that point. I was not sure at all what I was looking at. I told her I was going to go check it out, and she walked with me towards the dark mass. I think she was more so not wanting to stay back by herself versus interested in seeing it up close. But then, as we approached it and got closer, I could start to see that it seemed to have a small head and long arms sticking out of it. I didn't want to startle whatever it was and jeopardize our safety, so I whispered to my friend to be quiet, and that I thought it was a person, and we should be careful. 
I told her that we should not make any noise and just continue to walk past it like we didn't know it was there. We continued, but the closer we got, the more I could see that it was actually not a person. It was a large black mass that was alive, but not human. At this point, it took all of my strength to keep from running out of fear. I was able to walk past it slowly, but once we were about 20 feet past, I couldn't stop myself any longer, and I started to run. We ran about 100 yards and then stopped. We turned around and looked. The thing was now standing up on two legs, and it was facing us, looking at us. It was over eight feet tall and slender, which was weird given how large it looked on the ground. It had a small head and these long arms that hung down below its knees, and it was covered with fur. It didn't move, though. It just stood there, staring at us. I was scared, but now was developing this overwhelming need to see it up close. I wanted to see the details of its face. It was almost like I had no control over these urges. My friend was scared. She didn't want to go back with me, but I begged her, and so she did. We both slowly walked back towards it, and as we approached, I could see the details of something I had never seen before in my life. I looked it in the eyes, and it looked back at me with these very strange, long, protruding eyes that I can only describe as alien-like. The thing didn't move, just stood there, looking at me, only me, not my friend. And as it did, I felt like I was going into a trance. I couldn't look away, and I felt very strange. I felt like this thing was trying to communicate with me somehow but I didn't know what it was saying. And then it reached out to me with one of its big hands that had long, twig-like fingers that were bent strangely and wiggled in a way that I think they were beckoning me to come closer. Did it want me to take its hand? I didn't do it. I was scared and I did not know what I was dealing with. I was starting to come back into myself and I now wanted to run away, but I felt like I couldn't move. I think I was too scared to run, all the while trying to make sense of what was going on. But I couldn't do it. It was like my mind was telling me that this was not real, but my eyes were telling me that it was real. I was totally confused. I've never in my life felt so confused. And I really felt like I was staring at an alien. I'm not sure how long I stood there, but the trees and the sky were then spinning. Everything was spinning around me. I then had the idea to pinch myself to make sure I was awake. Well, that seemed to do it for me. I then did the only thing that I could to help myself, and that was to start running. I ran past my friend like a madwoman, and I started screaming that we have to get out of here. I don't even know if she heard me. I was screaming so loudly in my head, but my voice did not seem to be leaving my mouth. I think it was even running in the wrong direction, because at that point, I had no idea what was going on. I felt like I was suffocating. I felt like I was running for my life. I felt like I was going to die. I ran as fast as I could and I didn't even care where I was running. I just did not want to be there. Eventually, I miraculously ended up back at our car and jumped inside. My friend was right behind me. She was screaming and crying and she jumped in too. We drove home as fast as we could. We didn't say a word to each other the whole way home. We couldn't say a word. We were in shock. We were both crying and shaking. It was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. I still don't know what happened to me that day. I think I saw an alien or a creature that was not of this world. I think it was trying to communicate with me. I think it might have been trying to tell me something. But who knows what? I will never forget the face of that thing. My heart is even beating fast right now as I write this to you. I can't tell you how happy I am that I found you, Lilith, and this community. You've all given me so much hope. As I stepped out of my car at Grand Teton National Park, I felt a rush of excitement course through my body. I had always loved exploring the great outdoors, but this was my first time visiting this particular national park. The sun was setting, and I knew I had limited time to find a suitable campsite before darkness set in. I set up my tent in a clearing surrounded by trees, taking care to keep my headlamp on as I worked. 
Once I finished, I sat down on a nearby log to catch my breath. I took my time just letting the scenery sink in, and that's when I saw it. A creature lurking in the shadows of the woods. It was massive, easily over seven feet tall and covered in thick, matted fur with streaks of gray running through it. The fur seemed to be matted with dirt and grime, as if the creature had never groomed itself. I couldn't move, couldn't scream, I couldn't do anything but watch as it advanced towards me. Its eyes were the most terrifying part of the creature. They glowed with an eerie green light like two emerald gems that had been lit from within. They seemed to bore into me, as if the creature was staring right through me. Its arms were long and muscular, ending in sharp claws that dug into the ground with each step. Its legs were equally powerful, allowing it to move with an unsettling speed and agility. As it moved closer to me, I could hear the rustling of leaves and twigs underfoot, a sound that seemed to grow louder with each passing second. The creature's face was a twisted, grotesque mask of fury and rage. Its mouth was full of razor-sharp teeth, each one gleaming in the dim light of the woods. Its nostrils flared as it snarled, emitting a hot, rank breath that made my stomach churn. And when the creature came in for the attack, I got a closer look at its claws. They were long and curved, sharp enough to tear through flesh and bone with ease. They were even covered in what looked like dried blood and bits of flesh, evidence of its previous kills. Overall, it was a horrifying sight to behold. It was a monster straight out of a nightmare, and I knew that I had to be extremely cautious if I was going to survive my encounter with it. As it grew nearer, I finally managed to snap out of my paralysis and scramble up to my feet. I grabbed a stick lying on the ground, holding it up in a weak attempt at self-defense. The creature then let out a growl. I tried to back away, but my legs would not move fast enough. The creature then lunged forward as its claws were slashing at me with lightning speed. I barely managed to dodge its attacks, feeling the wind from its claws whistling past my face. In that moment, I realized that I had stumbled upon a creature unlike anything I had ever thought I would encounter. It was a monster straight out of a nightmare, and I was completely outmatched. I closed my eyes, bracing myself for a final blow, but it never came. When I opened my eyes, the creature was gone, vanished into thin air, leaving me alone in the dark woods. As I stumbled back to my campsite, shaking with fear and adrenaline, I couldn't help but wonder what other horrors this park might hold. I knew I had to be more careful more vigilant if I wanted to survive the night. But deep down, I also knew that no amount of caution could protect me from the creatures that lurked in the shadows. I did make it through that night. Obvious, because I'm writing to you here. But the next day, I knew I did not want to deal with any of those possible creatures. I packed up my stuff, and I hightailed it out of there. I worked as a ranger for the National Park Service for many years, and in that time I saw some pretty strange things, but nothing could prepare me for what I witnessed one day in Grand Teton National Park. I was out on patrol making my rounds through the park. It was late in September and the leaves were just starting to change color. The air was crisp and the sky was clear, and I remember thinking it was going to be a beautiful day. I was driving along the road, keeping an eye out for wildlife and any visitors in need of assistance. As I rounded a bend, I saw something moving in the bushes off to the side of the road. Or, more accurately, I should say that I saw the bushes shaking in an unusual way and that none of the other bushes were moving. So I rolled my vehicle to a stop closer to the bush, but remained inside. I wanted to be safe and not sorry in case I was about to encounter a sick or wounded animal. Animals that are scared or in shock can be very dangerous. What I observed next completely shocked me. It wasn't long before out from the undergrowth came this furry, large creature. At first I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but there, in front of me, was a creature I had never seen before. It was large, with a long snout almost a cross between a bear 
and a wolf and a rat, if you can picture those things together, but more the size of a bear. And the creature was just staring at me. I think the sound of my vehicle had brought it out. And for a moment we locked eyes and it cocked its head a bit and squinted. It just looked at me very intently. It was like it was almost trying to communicate with me. At least that's how I felt. Luckily, it didn't look wounded, so I felt better about that. And then as suddenly as it had appeared from the brush, it ran off, and it was gone. I sat in my car for a few minutes, trying to process it. I knew there were no animals like that in Grand Teton National Park, but what could it have been? Was I seeing things? Did I even see what I just saw? I then decided to get out of my vehicle and check the bushes that it had been in. Maybe there was something there that could help me understand what I had just seen. I walked over to the exact spot and looked down. There, in the grass, were large footprints. Wide footprints, with five toes and a ten-inch width. Well, that didn't help me because I definitely had never seen that footprint before. This was definitely not something I had seen, ever. And it honestly left me with more questions than answers. I radioed into headquarters and told them about the incident and what I was finding. My boss, who I really like a lot, told me to come back to the station and fill out a report. But to be honest, I don't think he really processed what I said because he didn't react with any surprise. He almost sounded distracted and just answering me without thinking. When I got back to the station, I sat down, wrote out the report of what I had seen, but even as I did, I still couldn't quite believe it myself. I did submit the report, and I went home that evening. But the image of that creature stayed with me. I just couldn't get it out of my mind. I did some research, and I found out that there have been other sightings of similar creatures in national parks across the country. Commonly, people refer to them as cryptids. There's no scientific evidence of their existence, but there are enough reports from reliable witnesses to make me believe that they are real. I never did see that creature again, but I often think about it, and I wonder where it came from, and what its life is like, honestly. Maybe one day we will have the answers to those questions, but until then, I'm just happy to know that there are still some mysteries. I haven't been able to share my story publicly, so I'm really glad that I found your channel. My friends and family have not been understanding, but I know your audience may have some insight as to what happened to me. I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 15 years, and I still don't know exactly what happened. I do believe, though, that I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum, or some other less cliché version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue, and the next second it was night. It happened when we were staying at my grandmother's house in rural Pennsylvania during the summer. It's really just Amish country where they live, and the roads are often filled with horses and buggies and men and women in similarly styled handmade clothes. When I was a kid, I loved going to my grandma's because it was just so different from the life that I had in New York City. So we'd been there for over a week at this point, and my mom and older brother had been arguing really badly the whole time. We'd had some lunch, and my brother had criticized Mom's cooking. They were in a shouting match, so I decided I just needed to get out of the house. Grandma had a small, wooded area behind her house, and I loved to go out there and explore. After her manicured lawn, a small creek divided the woods from the property, and there was a thick tree branch that stretched across the brook so I could use that to hop over the water, and then also used some big rocks as additional stepping stones. And once I got over the stream and into the woods, I basically just meandered about on my usual paths. Some time ago, my brother and I had set up a treehouse, so I decided I would go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. So I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak that once held our makeshift treehouse. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, it was a total shambles. And I decided that I'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I just started to turn around and walk back to the house, thinking I would just tell my brother what it looked like. When I reached the creek this time, there was this faint white glow coming from the water. I thought it was weird, looking back on it, but just figured that it was probably the angle of the sun or something. 
I mean, the water looked normal except for the edges and the ripples almost shined and sparkled in the light. It's sort of hard to explain. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything. So I had no clue why something like this would be happening. But I continued home. I just started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge. But when my foot touched the far bank, I felt a flash of light overtake my vision and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been even half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back on my feet and made my way back to the house. Luckily, I knew the property well and I made it there without incident. I then flung open the door and there stood my mother and my grandmother in the kitchen. The looks on their faces I've never seen before. And my grandmother was on the phone with the police. My brother was sitting quietly on the couch, but his head spun as soon as I opened the door. I could tell by looking at everybody's faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked, their eyes were red. My mom then asked me where I had been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently I had been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand at first because I'd only just walked five minutes into the woods. But they said they had searched and called my name and went down to the brook, but they never saw any signs of me. Nothing. I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that I somehow was caught in a time warp. There's no other explanation that's reasonable for what happened except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost or disoriented because my family searched the area. They would have seen me. I didn't go far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of that creek. It's just impossible that I was near where they were looking and not in some otherworldly place. Still none of them believes me, and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers and friends. When I saw the videos of your channel about portals in the woods and energy fields, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience, and my story was not, and is not, insane. I'm still looking for answers, but I'm just glad that I didn't lose too much time away from the real world. I never saw any other abnormalities in the stream. I have no other weird memories. But I can't easily go back there to check it out because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago. And after that, my family sold the property. But the new owners do seem relatively kind. So I'm thinking of writing to them to see if they minded if I could visit and walk around. I'm not going to mention the strange incident to them, but maybe I'll just say that I want to go back to the area of my childhood treehouse. That should work good enough. Either way, even if I go or not, surely there must be something more to this story. And something paranormal has to be going on with that creek.